So, what's the deal? I mean, this sounds like a simple concept, as you can see. You know, you've basically just got to do some fairly straightforward modifications to put a, a gene into the nucleus in a manner that means that it ought to work. What's actually really the problem? It's this problem. One word explains it all. Hydrophobicity. What is hydrophobicity? It is a property, a measure of how much proteins try to essentially get away from water. Hydro for water, phobicity for fear. Okay, so a protein that has a lot of hydrophobic amino acids in it tends to fold up into a ball so that it minimizes the contact that those amino acids have with water. The amino acids that are hydrophobic tend to be surrounded by other amino acids so that water can't get to them. And they do this, just they fall into a low energy state in that way. Why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because a protein that it wants to fold up into a ball takes a lot of energy to unfold. And it turns out that the machinery that imports a protein into the mitochondrion from the cytosol requires, absolutely requires, to unfold that protein. So these 13 proteins, it turns out, these 13 proteins that are encoded in the mitochondrial DNA are viciously hydrophobic, and they really, really don't like to unfold. We now believe that the only reason that that Australian group had such success in the 1980s were because they were working with such a small protein that by just you know, pulling really hard, the mitochondria were able to get the thing to work. But with a bigger protein, it just doesn't work, it just doesn't, doesn't happen. So this seems to be the only real difficulty. So there are some cases where hydrophobicity doesn't seem to matter too much. First of all, a lot of people look often at chloroplasts, which of course we don't have, they, they exist in plants, but they're interesting because they also have their own DNA. It's very similar in many ways to the mitochondrial DNA, um, and um, people are interested in, in comparing the two. Now it turns out that chloroplasts have quite a lot of genes encode, that they encode, in their DNA, that the proteins are not particularly hydrophobic. But also, there are proteins in the chloroplast that are really hydrophobic, and they get in okay. They seem to be imported without difficulty. But we know why that is, because actually this thing that I told you about with regard to having to unfold the protein in order to get it in isn't true in chloroplasts. They don't have a problem because essentially they don't do an important aspect of oxidative phosphorylation at the, in a membrane that surrounds the DNA. There are other examples in the mitochondrion. There's, something, there's a group of proteins called the anion carriers, which are really hydrophobic, but which also um, are encoded in the nuclear DNA. And they seem to be imported okay. But it turns out that the way that they're imported has, has evolved in a different way, and it's completely different, and for reasons that I don't have time to go into, we can't use that route to get these 13 proteins in. Um, there's another little hint, however. It turns out that you can make a protein that's got one really, really viciously hydrophobic slice in it, and it gets in okay. Okay, so long as there's not too many of these hydrophobic domains, as they're called, little sub substrings of the amino acid sequence, you don't seem to have a problem. And that's pretty interesting. Um, and we think we know what's going on now. A phenomenon was discovered about 35 years ago in yeast um, called co-translational import, where essentially what happens is that the proteins that are imported into the mitochondrion are imported while they are still being synthesized. The, protein, the import process begins before synthesis has really, really proceeded very far. And this turns out to be a rather interesting phenomenon. First of all, we don't know how it works, really. Um, we do find that it happens with a lot of these proteins. Um, what's so interesting about it? Well, the interesting thing is, if you think about it, it sidesteps the hydrophobicity problem completely. Because what it does is it causes the import process to happen before the protein has any opportunity to fold up the way it likes to do, being hydrophobic. Um, so this is basically the concept. Um, you've got the standard concept of um, protein import, where the protein is synthesized on um, ribosomes attached to the messenger RNA, and then after that the protein is targeted to the mitochondrion, and it gets stuck and it can't get through because it won't unfold. But then you've got this alternative thing where the messenger RNA is sitting on the outside of the mitochondrion being, being translated, and the protein is going straight in before folding up. A couple of years ago, a group in Paris made a massive breakthrough. I said that we don't know how this works, but we do know one thing now about how it works. 
we know that it's controlled by a region of the messenger RNA at the back end that doesn't actually encode any of the protein. It's called the three prime untranslated region. And it's at the far end of the messenger RNA. And because it doesn't encode any amino acids, you can, you can stick that sequence onto the back end of any protein you like, any coding sequence you like. So you can end up with a gene that encodes a protein that can be imported, even though the protein itself is hydrophobic. And it turns out that it works. This seems to be a more or less complete solution to the hydrophobicity barrier. We've got this situation now. This is data that was published uh, by this group a couple of years ago now, well, a year and a half ago. Um, and it's the same sort of deal, same sort of four, four growth curves that I showed you in a different context from the Zulo group from a few years ago. These two dark ones are the controls where the cells are growing perfectly well because they're growing in a medium where it's it, with glucose where they don't need oxidative phosphorylation. And this bottom line is the um, cells which do not have the ability, do not have the new gene, and they can't grow in galactose, which is the non-permissive medium. And sure enough, this one is what matters, the cells growing in the non-permissive medium, but with the transgene, and they're perfectly happy. So we're pretty happy about this. Um, mutations do accumulate during aging. They may be really important. Uh, we may be able to make them not matter, to obviate them, by putting copies of those genes, suitably modified copies, into the nucleus. And we have, you know, maybe some way to go to get the, the whole story working, to get all 13 of these proteins working at the same time in the same cells, but it's going pretty well. Of course, after this, we've then got only, um, we can only use this therapeutically if we can get those genes into our cells of people who are already alive. And for most of the types of cell that are affected by this problem during aging, that means we're going to have to develop really good, safe and effective gene therapy, which as all of you know, is still some way away. But even that is an area in which there is considerable progress at the moment. So we have reasonable cause for optimism. And the sooner we push this forward more energetically, the sooner it'll actually happen. So I'm going to stop there on this talk. Uh, I think that's, you know, it's not going forward anymore, so that must be my last slide. Um, and I'm happy to stop here and ask que answer questions for a few minutes. Stop, yeah, stop, one back, that's it. Um, uh, for a few minutes before going on to the other, one, other part of my presentation. Be most relevantly affected by this intervention. Right, so the cell types that tend to accumulate mitochondrial mutations to the greatest abundance are the post-mitotic cell types, cell types that have become constitutively unable to divide. So that means things like skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, neuro neurons, things like that. I think personally that skeletal muscle is probably the number one target because the mechanism by which mitochondrial mutations actually matter, actually cause, con cause a contribution to aging despite being present at low abundance is probably through an elaborate sequence of chemistry that goes on in the circulation in our bloodstream. So that means that all cells that are, that are um, problematic affect the whole body. And therefore, muscle is likely to matter more than anything else simply because we have so much of it. So in pure mass action terms, the large majority of our mutant mitochondrial DNA and our cells affected by mutant mitochondria are in skeletal muscle. So that's my feeling. Aubrey, what's your feeling about uh, what you know, Bruce Ames has been working on, uh, which interests me a lot, which is uh, the effective effect of lipoic acid mm -hmm. and carnitine? Right. Uh, I think I read recently because of cytochrome oxidase. Okay, so, so um, yeah, the, the, the real active ingredient in what Bruce Ames has been pursuing with Juvenon for some time now is acetyl-L-carnitine, which increases the rate of import of fatty acids into mitochondria and thereby increases their um, activity. And lipoic acid is what he's using now. He was originally using PBN as an antioxidant to, to, to address the side effect of of, of upregulating fatty acid import, which turned out to be free radical production. Okay, so um, yes, it's a very, very interesting approach, and it certainly does cause, superficially, rejuvenation of mitochondrial activity, and consequently, um, you know, rejuvenation of overall you know, tissue and, and organismal activity in, in rodents. That's terrific. Problem is, though, it, of course, does not have anything to do with mitochondrial mutations. It doesn't affect mitochondrial mutations at all. It just affects those aspects of mitochondrial function that are already encoded in the nucleus and are not actually um, affected by mitochondrial mutations. 
So we have a question we must ask here. We must ask whether it might actually be possible to improve lifespan or to have this be a, con a contributing factor to improving lifespan if lifespan is in any way limited by mitochondrial mutations. And I'm a little bit pessimistic. I think that actually it might be a bit like putting your pedal to the metal on a car that's about to fall apart. It might actually shorten the lifespan of the car. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a problem. Now, of course, Bruce understands that this is a potential um, interpretation of what's going on. He knows that it's not supposed to be a complete solution to mitochondrial aging. So he's interested in doing lifespan studies, and he's only been able to do one so far, and it was negative. It came out negative. Um, he's not happy with it as a conclusive result because a lot of the mice died of cancer, so his view is, well, maybe he um, only affected other aspects of aging and not cancer, and he wants to do more lifespan studies. But they're expensive. I definitely would love him to be funded to do more lifespan studies on Alcar and Lipo-8, for sure. It's a very interesting approach, but it's not really relevant to what I've just talked about. One more question.